Well, good morning. How's everybody doing? Let's take a moment. I'm going to look right at the camera. Shout out to the South Mountain campus that's across town. Let's clap our hands and welcome them. Thank you for joining us. Also want to welcome all those that are watching online. Man, we are so glad that you're synced up with us. We believe God has something special in store for you. And if you're here for the very first time, you're extra special today. You're our VIP, and we just want to say welcome home. Let's clap our hands for all of our first-time guests. We're so glad that you decided to worship with us this morning. I love Pastor Ryan and Pastor Amy so much. Uh, Pastor Ryan is a gift from God to my life. And he's a gift from God to the kingdom of God. And sometimes it takes someone from the outside to remind you how good you have it. No one else can preach on sexuality, abortion, critical race theory, and then go on vacation and let your friend come preach. <laughs> I'm like, really, bro? How are you going to do me like that? I'm so grateful for him because they make truth easy to find. It's so hard to find truth today, and they make truth easy to find through the power of the Holy Spirit, through the foundational teaching in God's Word, and sometimes it takes someone from the East Coast to come all the way over here. My body clock is all messed up. I'm wide awake in the middle of the night just to remind you that what God is doing here at GC is so important and it's so special. Do not take it for granted. Last time I was here... Yeah. Last time I was here, we had the little shovels and we had the groundbreaking ceremony for the parking lot. And I just walk around this place and I've been to the South Mountain location as well. And I walk around and I say, like, this is a miracle from God. If you only knew the, the uniqueness and the fragility by which you should be stewarding the, the kingdom impact that Generation Church is making. I, I liken it to like the, the Israelites getting out of 400 years of generational slavery. Moses has raised his, his staff above the water. The waters have parted. And I just picture in my mind, like this is the moment that their grandfathers had been praying for, that their great-grandfathers had been praying for. These were the moments that they had just conjured up in their imagination. It was really happening in the flesh. And I just picture like fathers next to their sons, a million people having this exodus. And I just picture them like walking through the water and just looking around and being like, oh my goodness, it's actually happening. Like, Dad, can I please rub my hands against this water? Am I allowed? Can I touch this miracle that we're in the middle of? And when I walk around here and when I, when I get around this atmosphere, I, let me tell you, I travel a lot and I preach a lot all over the country. When I come here, I'm like asking Pastor Ryan, how is this real? Because it's a miracle to be stewarded. And so every chance you get, grab your, your son or daughter by the neck and say, we are a part of a move of God. Go out to that new parking lot and touch that asphalt that's brand new and be like, this is a miracle. You are a part of something so special and so unique. And it's because of your pastor's their boldness, their ability to follow God in trying times to speak truth when truth is hard to find. And it's so important that you know, I'm, I'm from the outside letting you know that you're, there are walls of water currently and you are being led in a miracle moment to your next season. And it's so important that you take that with such sensitivity and honor. So let's clap our hands at both of our campuses for our pastors, pastors Ryan and Amy. We love you. I'm sure you're coming back with a tan, so that's awesome. If you have a copy of God's Word, we're going to be in the book of 1 Corinthians in the 16th chapter. If you don't have a copy of God's Word, uh, it'll be on the screens for you. This is the Apostle Paul. He's writing around 53, 54 AD to the church in Corinth, and he's basically gone through 16 chapters of just great instruction and teaching, and then he has some final thoughts, and he's kind of letting them know practically where he's at. And uh, this is what he says in, in chapter 16, 1 Corinthians, verses 5 through 9. Are you ready for God's word? All right. He says, I am coming to visit you after I have been to Macedonia, for I am planning to travel through Macedonia. Perhaps I will stay a while with you, possibly all winter, and then you can send me on my way to my next destination. That's his 
request for a GoFundMe. He's like, you can send me on my way to my next... Basically meaning, when I come, we're going to take an offering, just so you know. That's what he's saying in his, in his letter. This time, I don't want to make just a short visit and then go right on. I want to come and stay a while if the Lord will let me. Verse 8. In the meantime, I will be staying here at Ephesus until the festival of Pentecost. And verse 9 is so important. It says... There is a wide open door for a great work here, although many oppose me. One more time. There is a wide open door for a great work here, although many oppose me. Let's pray. Father, use your word. We thank you for it because it is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. It is clear, it is convicting, it is compelling, and we're so grateful for it. We submit our lives to the teaching of your word today, and we say, show us, enlighten us, bring us to a place of understanding, bring us to a place of belief, and if there's anyone in here today that doesn't know your son Jesus, I pray that by the end of our service today, that they would have received you. Those watching online, if they don't know you, Lord, that they would have maybe stumbled across this live feed. I just pray that they would come to a moment of decision. Those at the South Mountain campus, if there's anyone that does not know you, at the sound of my voice, I pray that you would be lifted up and that people would be brought to a point of decision today. We love you. We thank you for your word. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. I was on a road trip with my children recently, and something happened that was just glorious. They got along. I mean, it got so quiet in the back seat. They were sharing the same iPad. I said, Whoo, Holy Ghost, more of this. I'm going to take a picture of this right now. I'm going to remember this moment for the rest of my life. They were sharing headphones. I was like, Okay, Lord, I must be living right. I must be paying my tithe. They were sharing the same device watching some shows, watching probably some YouTube uh, tutorials about a toy that I won't buy them, you know, some sort of slime or something, watching someone else play with the toy that they want me to buy them, but I'm not going to buy them that toy. So instead, I just tell them to watch someone with the toy that I'm not going to buy them. <laughs> and then they, they, they moved on to some, some show, and they were watching a show, and um, and it, it happened. It was bound to happen. I knew that I couldn't live in these glory days for very long. My, the, I mean, the victory was, was momentary. And all of a sudden, I hear, you've heard it before, ah, stop. And I just, you know, you put your, you know, I'm driving, right? So I say, Jesus, take the wheel. I'm about to get back up in here. Don't make me pull this car over. Y'all grew up like that? My mom popped open the glove box. Six different wooden spoons fell out. Four chanclas, which is like flip-flops, six wooden spoons. Don't make me pull this car over. And I said, what's going on? I said, Jesus, take the wheel. Turn around. What's going on? (laughs) And my son says, she won't let me watch the credits. (laughs) She's skipping through the credits. I said, really? (laughs) The credits? He was mad about the credits. He wanted to watch the credits. He was convinced that there was some mysterious thing that was going to happen in the credits. But she pressed the button on Netflix or, or Disney Plus or whatever that says, you know, next episode. Because you can skip the credits now. Now, when we grew up, you know how it was when we grew up. There was no skipping nothing. You watched all of it before and after. But these days, kids are spoiled. I was watching a show on Netflix. I could skip the intro. I could skip the recap from the last episode, and I could skip the credits. Just give me the content. Give me what I came for. Just give me the meat of the message. I don't want to know the intro. I don't want to see the recap, and I don't want to see the credits. And they were fighting about the credits, about the fact that she had fast-forwarded the credits. And here in 1 Corinthians 16, these are the credits This is Paul just finishing up. He's like, here are my travel plans. 
here are some things that I'm planning on doing. I want to visit you, but I got to go to Macedonia. Then maybe I'll, I'll come through. But when I come through, you're going to have to send me on my way to the next time. And then in the middle of the credits, in the middle of just his closing, his close, he just says, verse 9, there is a great opportunity. It says there is a wide door, wide open door for a great work here. Although many oppose me. What insight do we just receive? That Paul was not scared of opposition as long as it was coupled with opportunity. He was, he was willing to stay put when people were against him, when there was a war against him, when he was going through a struggle, he was willing to stay put because he put up his opposition up against the open door and he said the open door is greater than the opposition against me. How many of you know that this is so applicable to our lives? Like every time God opens a door, we seem to be confronted with great opposition. Like every time you start to tithe, your car breaks down. 100% 100% guarantee. You want your car to break down? Just start to tithe. The engine will fall out as you leave the parking lot. It happens all the time. Why? Because you, you have opportunity and opposition, and they're, they're both a tension, and they, they, we wrestle with that all the time. Your marriage gets on the right track, man. You see a counselor, everything is good, and then all of a sudden, someone reminds you of something in your past, and you go back to those old arguments that you thought, you had buried and gone. Why? Because it's a, it's a tension that we wrestle with. You pray to God, God, give me, give me, the, give me kids. I want, I, want, I want to have a family. I want to start a family. And then your family shows up. <laughs> and he's like, here you go. This is what you prayed for. Great opportunity to start a family. Opposition sometime in raising a family. Why? Why? Because we understand that this is a tension that we deal with in life. All the time. You know, you want a new job, you want a promotion, and then in comes the promotion, and then you realize how much more responsibility the promotion was. Opportunity, open doors are coupled with opposition. And it's the same that, that Paul was expressing. It's just like a, a rubber band. It's it's not really a problem that we can solve. It's really a tension that we must wrestle with. See, this rubber band is of no threat to anybody currently. Like if I threw this at you, there was no reaction whatsoever. There's like zero response. Why? Because there's no tension. But if I pull this bad boy back, what am I creating here? I'm creating tension. He's like, there's a wide open door for effective work, great door for ministry, although many oppose me. And it's like, well, which one is it, Paul? He's like, it's both. And the Christian life, anyone that's gone through anything in their life, any mature believer is going to know that it's both grace and truth. You just came out of this whole series, right? It's grace and truth. It's opportunity and opposition. It's I'm obedient, I'm faithful, I'm loyal, and the devil takes note, and he tries to pull you back. It is not effective unless it has tension. The reason it has tension is because there are polarizing forces at play. And I don't know about you, but I want to live in the favor of God. I want to live at a place where I have a wide open door of great opportunity, much like Paul says. But I know at the same time, when I go to step through doors of opportunity, the enemy will try to work against me by by creating opposition. It's only effective. This rubber band is only a threat when there's tension. And it's not really a problem to be solved it's really a tension to be wrestled with. Like opposition, you can't just run from opposition because sometimes opposition is indicative of great opportunity. Like uh, you live in, in a great state. This is amazing. The weather here is incredible. What an opportunity. Like I was out yesterday, my phone shut down. It's like the devil is a liar. I was FaceTiming my wife, and it was like, can't handle the heat. (laughs) Why? Because when this great, beautiful state also comes with shutting down your phone in the heat, right? (laughs) Opportunity, 
and opposition. It's really a tension to be wrestled with, not a problem to be solved. It even says this in, in Philippians 1, 20 through, 22 through 24. It says, uh, but if I live, I can do more fruitful work for Christ. So I really don't know which is better. I'm torn between two desires. I long to be with Christ, which would be far better for me, but for your sakes, it is better that I continue to live. Well, which one is it? The writer says, I'm torn between two desires. Do I want to go to heaven? Absolutely. Do I want to be singing the glorious praises in eternity, surrounded by the glory of God? Absolutely. Who wouldn't want that? We all do. But at the same token, my neighbor doesn't know Jesus. At the same token, my coworker doesn't know the Lord. So which one is better for me to be with Christ in eternity or for me to really hone in on my evangelism gift until he comes back or until he takes me home? It's a tension that I will wrestle with. I want to be with God for eternity, but I also have work to do here on earth. It is a tension that we wrestle with. We all, we all deal with this. We all, we all have many opportunities that also come with opposition. As a matter of fact, Jesus himself wrestles with this tension several different times. In one of the verses in John 16, he says, I have told you all of this so that you may have peace in me. Here on earth, you will have many trials and sorrows. No, I don't want trials and sorrows. Here on earth, you will have many, tr- you, not if you might. He was, like, he was like, this is the guarantee. You follow me? This is the guarantee, trials and sorrows. But take heart because I have overcome the world. Well, which one is it? Well, it's both. It's trials and sorrows and it's overcoming the world. It's trials and sorrows and it's overcoming the world. And if you're able to live in this tension, what you'll eventually find is that you learn maturity in the moment of your stretching. In the, in the moment of your trials. Even Jesus himself, he got water baptized. How many of you have been water baptized? Woo, praise God. After water baptism, you should always go to Golden Corral. Okay? Every time you're water baptized, you just say, Mom, take me to Golden Corral. Okay? If you see someone get baptized here at Generation, invite them to Golden Corral. It, it's just part of our faith. It's just, it's an income. <laughs> Is salvation, water baptism, golden corral, then baptism in the spirit. Those are the progression that we go. Just kidding. About the golden corral part. Jesus gets water baptized, doesn't go to golden corral. Matthew 4, 1, then Jesus, right after his water baptism, was led by the spirit, the Holy Spirit, into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. How many of you want to live a life led by the Spirit? Let me see your hands. At both of our campuses, you want to live a life led by the Spirit. Awesome. How many of you want to be tempted by the devil? No hands. Okay. Right here, Jesus didn't get to go to Golden Corral. The Holy Spirit leads him to the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Oh, I want to be led by the Spirit. Well, Jesus was led by the Spirit to be tempted by the devil. Be careful in the tension that you don't just ask for one and not expect the other. Because every time you live this life, this Christian life is full of tense times. I'm doing what's right. I'm raising my kids in the way that they should go. Why are they not succeeding like I thought they would? It is a tension to be wrestled with. Even at the end of his life, on on earth, Jesus Jesus says, Father, not my will. If you would, take this cup from me. If there was any way, if there's any other way, even Jesus is saying, if there was any other way, and praise God, he went to the cross. Praise God, he chose to follow God, even in a tense time where there was opposing, polarizing forces at work. I don't know about you, but I want to live in the favor of God. I want to live obedient. I want to live in a place where even though I feel tension, I feel the fight that I'm still in the favor of God. I still want to live in the favor of God. You know, you rarely have favor without a fight. Nobody wakes up floating on a favor cloud. (laughs) Hello, brother and sister, and we're so glad you're here. Favor sometimes comes with the fight. 
Every time you make progress in the kingdom, the enemy takes note. You know who the enemy's not worried about? Mediocrity. Casual. You know, the, this doesn't scare the enemy. Just some kind of casual Christian comes sometimes to church, sometimes they don't. It's like on the list of things to do for the weekend, but never a priority. That doesn't scare the enemy. What scares the enemy is a polarizing force against the force of darkness. Someone that carries light with passion, conviction, and an understanding that truth is hard to find, but I'm going to stand on it. That's what scares the enemy. So if you, I mean, you want the favor of God. I want the favor of God. Nobody's raising their hands anymore because they're scared. He's like, he told me I'd be tempted by the devil. I'm not raising my hand in this church ever again. We all want the favor of God. But what I found is a lot of times the favor of God never comes without a fight. Every time, every time I try to go do something, the devil takes note. I mean, every time I try to, try to plan for, every time I try to go talk to my friend about Jesus, he wants to talk about something different, low-key or something. I don't even know what low-key is. I don't even know about these shows. I'm like, I just want to talk to you about Jesus. He's like, no, let's talk about sports. Speaking of sports, how about those Phoenix Suns? Let's go. Come on, South Mountain Campus. Aren't you stoked about those Phoenix Suns? Dab on the haters. Dab on the Clippers. Every time you try to make progress in your spiritual life, I'm trying to help you. You will probably encounter opposing forces. And those aren't, those aren't, those aren't to be kind of just pushed off to the side. It's a tension to be wrestled with. It's something to understand. When I start reading my Bible, that's when all of my thoughts and my things I do are going to have to, you know, when you start praying, that's when all your to-do list starts coming into your mind. Isn't it true? It's, I mean, the moment I say, okay, I'm giving you the next hour, Lord. I've blocked everything out. And then the moment I sit down, he's like, well, do you ever think about flat earth? My mind begins to, it's, 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 some, it's favor that must be fought for. It must be, it must be intentional. You're going to have to wake up earlier to fight for that favor. You're going to have to stay up later to fight for that favor. You're going to have to raise those kids in the way that they should go so that they should not depart from it. Why? Because favor sometimes comes with a fight. And if you're not careful, a lot of times you'll, you'll ask for favor but not be prepared for the fight. Ephesians says to, to stand firm, to take on the full armor of God, to be ready to fight. Why? Because I want to live in the favor, but the face of favor sometimes has a fight. You got to be ready to fight. I've met so many people who pray for favor, but aren't ready for the fight. But when you get favor, know this, the fight is on. The force against me is usually indicative of the favor that's on me. So when I do experience pushback, I'm like, oh, God must be up to something. I must be doing something right because I'm disturbing the enemy. Why has he commissioned demons over my car right now? Where did this traffic come from? I must be doing something right because every time I go to live a life worthy of the call of God, somehow, some way, the enemy comes against me. Isn't it amazing? You're going to be going on a good streak. You'd be like, I'm, I'm doing good. I'm doing good. And then all of a sudden, poof, right in the face. That's the enemy taking note that the favor of God is on you. You want to know what triggers the devil? Favor. Favor triggers the enemy. And the reason the enemy comes against you is because you have so much to offer to the kingdom of God. And he's scared that if he doesn't stop you right now, that you'll reach your fully God-given potential and you won't be able to, you, you'll, you'll stop short of the gift and the call that is on your life. And I want to let you know, God's favor rests upon you. Thieves only steal what's valuable. <laughs> so if you feel like you're being robbed right now, it's because there's something inside of you worth, worth stealing. I recently put in a security system in my house, uh, ADT, something like that. And the guy was knocking on doors. He's like, you know, can I show you the system? I'm like, yeah, come on in, I guess, and give you a chance. But I'm going to give you Jesus at the end of this thing, you know. 
I was like, you give me your presentation, I'm going to give you my presentation, okay? We'll call it even. <laughs> he sold me. Um, so I bought this system, and he, we're going through where all the sensors are, you know, in the house. He's like, there's going to be a sensor here at this door and a sensor here at this door. And he's like, if your kid tries to leave out the window, we got a sensor there. I'm like, yes, I'm going to need that one day, you know? And uh, then we got to the garage, and he goes, he goes, there won't be any sensors in the garage. And I said, why not? He said, because nobody ever puts anything of value in their garage. He said, <laughs> somebody said, yes, I do. Okay. <laughs> For the sake of this story, I don't put anything valuable in my garage. <laughs> he, said, he said, they can take your rake, they can take your shovel, they can take your kid's bike, but what you don't want them to do is to get inside. That's where the real threat is at. The, the, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And so just know that there is protection around you and that's the favor of God on your life. And it frustrates the enemy when he sees favor on your life. It frustrates the devil when you start to live right and live holy and live righteous. It frustrates the enemy so much that he will begin to watch how you're living your life and start to, start to really try to get you to think about your past. Are you really committed? Are you really, is that just all for show? Are you really going to do that? That's the whisper of the enemy. That's the attack of the enemy. And, and, and here's how I know that you are doing something good for God. The other day I was uh, teaching my son how to harvest deer. I'm trying to be PETA friendly, but we go deer hunting in the South. We try to fill our freezer, you know, try to provide for our family. You never know. You never know when you might need to eat some deer instead of being able to go to, to Walmart. So my kid is 11. I'm teaching him how, you know, we, we got to uh, make sure that we don't smell like humans, so we put some dough urine on the bottom of our boots. Doesn't seem like fun just yet, but I promise it's a good time. We're walking softly through the woods in the middle of the night while it's dark. He's up, you know, he's, he's 11. Remember, he's it's middle of the night. You know, we're getting up into this tree. It's cold. And he's like, I don't like it. I'm like, no, it's fun. We're gonna have a good time. Trust me. And day after day, we got up, <laughs> middle of the night, put dough urine on our boots, went to the tree stand, sit up there in the cold, waiting for something to happen. And, you know, a lot of it's just father-son bonding time. A lot of it's just, you know, talking to God, having a good time. And we, we haven't seen nothing All right, a couple of days. I didn't see nothing a couple of days. Later on that week, we're in the car, and there's a deer that has been hit on the side of the road. He said, Dad, stop the car. He said, I got one. He said, we got one. It's on the side of the, side of the road. I said, dude, we can't. We are that hillbilly, okay? We're not, we're not there. We're there, but we're not there, you know what I'm saying? I said, I said, we, I said th we didn't hunt this. I said, we only hunt things that are alive. And the same is true for the enemy on your life. You aren't roadkill for the kingdom of God that just gets passed over. The reason you are under attack is because the enemy sees God's given potential over your life. You're alive. You're not dead. God's not done. And when he sees the favor of God on your life, he's trying to get you to quit. He's trying to get you to stop. But I came all the way from North Carolina to tell the South Mountain Campus, do not give up. If you are not dead, then God is not done no weapon formed against you will prosper you aren't roadkill you aren't off to the side somewhere you're an actual threat to the enemy and that's why there's a target on your chest you're only a threat if you are alive and because you are alive the devil can't stand it but it's a tension that we wrestle with it's a tension that we wrestle with he only targets the favored so if you feel targeted it's because you're favored. Pastor, I'm just going through a hard time right now, just really struggling. That's because God's hand's on your life. And the devil doesn't like to see God's hand on your life. You done triggered the enemy. You done triggered it. Triggered. And you got to learn to live with that tension. There's a great door, a wide open door of opportunity. Although many oppose me, it's both. It's a tension that we wrestle with. And God's favor will shine on your face. It says in Psalm 67, 1, it says, May God be merciful and bless us, and may his face 
smile with favor on us. When they were stoning Stephen in the book of Acts, it says that his face shone with the glory of God. His face, they were, they, were, they were literally throwing rocks at him and his face was still able to reflect the glory of God. I don't know what problems you have. I don't know what you're going through, but it is possible to have favor and be under attack and still allow your face to shine with the favor of God. Have you ever seen uh, the show uh, Extreme Home Makeover? Hey, Ty Pennington here. Welcome to Extreme Home Makeover. We're going to have a great week here. It's going to be awesome. Let's go meet the family. You ever seen that show before? I don't know if that's a good Ty Pennington or not, but <laughs> it's a great show. I love the show because it, it's awesome. It, they usually, just to catch all the youngins up that might not have seen it before, they take a family in need. Usually they had either disaster or something uh, bad has happened to their family, and they rebuild their house in a week from the ground up. They send the family to Disney World, and Ty Pennington and all of his, all of his crew and a bunch of volunteers all wearing the same shirt, like a mission trip to Nicaragua, they all wear the same shirt. They, they all come in. And they help, they help clean out the old house, and they help build up the new house. Have you seen this show before? It's called Extreme Home Makeover. Okay, cool. Um, while the family is away, you know, Ty will get updates on FaceTime at Disney World. The, the family's at Disney World. Ty's here. He's like, hey, little Sally, how's it going? I'm doing good, Ty. Everything's great. You know, all right. We heard that you like Frozen the movie. Do you like Frozen the movie? Oh, I love Frozen. Awesome. Well, we got you a Frozen room, and it's like icicles everywhere, and the princesses have exploded, you know, in the room. They're redoing their room, you know. And then Ty the next day is like FaceTiming with little Johnny. Hey, little Johnny, how's it going, man? Are you doing good? Yeah, I'm doing great. Well, we heard you like Bon Jovi. I love Bon Jovi. Well, we made you. Here's Bon Jovi right here. And then Bon Jovi shows up. And he's like signing autographs and puts the guitar in his room. And his whole room is like living on a prayer, the, the whole deal. You know, it's, it's amazing. It's an amazing show. It's incredible. And they get to the point at the end of the show when the family is returning and they return on this mega bus. They return on this humongous bus. And uh, the bus actually gets in between the house and the, the family so they can't see their new house. Okay? You guys have seen the show before, right? And it's all, it's all leading up to this. I think they have a... Yeah, there, there's my guy right there. Um, and it's all leading to this moment and they begin to do product placement. You know, they show the refrigerator. It's like, you know, Kenmore. And then it's like Lowe's Hardware and Home Depot and all the, all the different, you know, sponsors. And they build this up and they go, move that bus. Move that bus. You guys have seen this, right? Move that bus. And there's like a crane shot over all the people. It's an amazing moment. All the clips are going real fast. And then all of a sudden, it's like a commercial break. It's the worst. It's like, I don't care about Taco Bell, Gordy, Gordita Crunch tacos right now. I want to see the house. It's called Extreme Home Makeover. Give me, I can't skip through the commercials on live TV. And they build it back and they say, you know, are you ready to see your house? We've been working on it all week. Remember, they, they haven't seen it yet. They've been at Disney World. And they're on the one side of the bus. And then they start, they start this chant. They start, move that bus. Move that bus. Say it with me. Move that bus. Move that bus. Move that bus. And then they move the bus. And it's this big moment. It's the big reveal. Do you know, do you know what the first, the first clip after they move the bus is? What, it's called Extreme Omega. What's the first shot? They show the faces of the family instead of showing the house. I signed up for extreme home makeover. I didn't sign up for extreme face makeover. We just moved the bus. We've been looking at these faces this whole, the whole week. Why do they cut to the faces before they cut to the house? Because you can see the house on their faces. 
you can see the favor on their faces. So when you walk to opposition, when you walk through the valley of the shadow of death, when you walk through the storm, may the glory of God, may the favor of God rest on your face so that when you walk through the storm, when you walk through the trial, you can reflect the glory of God. Many of you came in here today and you know that you've been going through a tough time. You've been going through a really tense time. You've had this, you've been wrestling. And I just want to encourage you with this. Allow the favor of God to rest upon you. Allow his favor to rest upon your face so that when you go through a hard time, when they look at you, they can see God. Because when you see those families, you can see the house on their faces. Let's pray today. Maybe you came in here today with every head bowed and every eye closed at both of our campuses. You say, I'd never experienced the grace of God through his son, Jesus. I've been going through a hard time, but I don't have any hope. I've been going through a hard time, but I don't have any, any grace. I don't, I, I don't know Jesus. I need to know the Lord. You came in here today. Maybe you're skeptical. Maybe you just started coming to, to generation. Maybe this is your very first time. Maybe you've been coming for a while, but you know that today's the day for you to give your life to Christ. Today's the day for you to begin to reflect the glory of God on your face. You've been trying to go at it alone and you can't, but I want to let you know that God sent his son Jesus to die on a cross for you. And at both of our locations, I know that in a, in, a, in a crowd this size and those watching online, there must be one person who's looking to give their life to Christ today. And God sent me all the way from North Carolina to bring you this message of hope that you have not been forgotten, that you have not been abandoned, but instead grace runs deep in this church. And it's through the Son of God. His name is Jesus. And so with every head bowed and every eye closed, it would be an honor for me to be able to pray with you that you would receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior at both of our locations. If that's you today, everyone at the sound of my voice, you say, I need Jesus in my life. This sermon was for me and I need to be saved. I need to give my life to Christ. If that's you, would you just lift your hand so that I can pray for you right now? Just lift it high enough so that I can see it. Praise God. Praise God. I see these hands all over the place at our South Mountain campus. Just keep your hand up right now until someone brings you a gift. They're bringing you a gift right now. Keep your hand up. Keep your hand raised. High enough so that we can see it. See someone right here in the middle. Praise God. Anyone else? Don't miss this moment. Your life is going to be changed forever. Don't miss this moment. Keep your hand up until we bring you a gift. Thank you, Jesus. We're going to bring you a Bible right now. At both of our locations, we're bringing you a Bible right now. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Welcome to the family of God. Welcome. You just made one of the most important decisions of your life. And let me be the first to say, I am so proud of you. I am so proud of you. Yeah, let's clap our hands and welcome them to the family of God. Here's what I want to do. For the sake of those that just raised their hands and just to encourage them, everyone at the sound of my voice, let's all say a prayer together, okay? Father God, repeat after me. Say, Father God, I give you my life. Thank you for sending your son, Jesus, to die on a cross for my sins. I repent and I give my life to you. In Jesus' name, amen.